three, two, one. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this national webinar series on Discharge to Assess. I'm Angela Bullivan, an Improvement Manager with the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team, and I'm pleased today to present the fourth in a series of seven webinars we're running on Discharge to Assess. Today's webinar will focus on joint commissioning, and I've got five speakers with me today um, who I'm going to just run through and ask them to introduce a little bit about themselves. So first up, we've got Leon Goddard from the LGA. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, Leon Goddard, um, I'm part of the Care and Health Improvement Programme, which is jointly run by ADAS and the LGA. Um, spent the last 10, 12 years um, commissioning care home services, home care services and the like, um, always from a council role, but um, obviously done a lot around joint commissioning and the role I'm in at the moment um, is supporting councils and systems across the country uh, in their commissioning activity. Thank you, Leon. I've got Dr. Andrew Williams and Dennis Holmes from eSyst. Hello, I'm Andrew Williams. I'm a community obstetrician down in Dorset and regional clinical director for ESIS for South East and South West England. Hi, I'm Dennis Holmes. I'm the uh, social care improvement advisor for the ESIS team in the north of England. Previously worked for 34 years in local government um, as uh, primarily a commissioner in adult social care services. I've also done work with the local government association of better care support team up and down the country with systems around particular issues with commissioning. Thank you both. And then I have Jenny Stevens and Tim Goldby from the Devon system. Hi everybody, I'm Jenny Stevens. I'm Chief Officer at Devon County Council. I'm in that role I'm also the Director of Adult Social Services. I've been in Devon quite a long time but also worked at um, uh, NA in NHS uh, roles uh, alongside NHSE type roles and also at Department of Health um, as well as in joint roles in the days of PCT. So I've um, uh, been around both the NHS and local government for some time. I'm also a registered social worker. Hello everyone, uh, my name's Tim Golby. I'm a locality director for North and East Devon. That's a joint appointment between NHS Devon CCG and Devon County Council. We cover a population of uh, north of 500,000 uh, people and we work across two hospital systems. So I'm delighted to be on the call today and looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Thank you. Thank you all. And I have two of my colleagues with me, Helen Krasinski and Kate Pound, who will be working in the background to capture all of the conversations and questions that are happening in the chat room. Um, so because it's a Teams live event, everybody will be muted, all participants. So if you do have any questions um, that you want to ask of our speakers and our panellists, um, we have Sarah Mitchell um, and we have uh, Liz Sargent and uh, and all of our speakers as well today will form part of the panel, then please do put those in the chat box um, and they will be collected. So uh, without further ado, I think Leon, if you're ready to go, we'll hand back over to you, please. Thank you. OK, yeah, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So just a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today, um, all from a quite a general point of view, um, drawing upon uh, experience from um, the, the authorities I've worked in, but mostly from across the country and, and some of the experience I've got working with colleagues um, who are in, in very different situations. So um, I'll just give a, a broad analysis of that and then talk a little bit about the discharge policy uh, and then try to bring to life some of the challenges, but also the opportunities that I see around joint commissioning. So uh, uh, probably an oversimplistic analysis, but what I would want to emphasise is that this is a very real analysis as far as I'm concerned, that um, the, the, you know, the conversations I'm having with, with people who are, who are trying to do joint commissioning are, are directly feeding back these experiences. Um, there's, there's good, there's bad and there's things in the middle, but I think it's important to start with just setting out the reality. Um, and of course, you'll know your own reality of how it feels uh, in your area, but um, there are some common, I would say, common situations. So um, we do come across situations where 
um, joint commission relationships are uh, either non-existent or weak or in some cases actually quite counterproductive um, typically around just simply different priorities of different parts of the system um, and where when looked at it, when looked at through a purely commissioning lens they are essentially competing with each other um, be the, be the CCG and, uh, and local authorities um, it's not a common position for us to to say what's good or bad but I, I think we'd, we'd, we'd identify those things as uh, certainly um, unhelpful in a, in a joint commissioning setting. Um, moving across the spectrum, um, we'll, we all hear that, you know, there's pockets of good practice reference and, and whilst that's on one level great, I, I th I'd hope that our aspirations have moved on in the last few years. That means actually what we're aiming for is consistent um, working, consistent good practice, consistent um, sharing of priorities uh, and where the relationships that we have and the, the, the commissioning activity that's been undertaken um, is actually adding value to the system and it, it, it's greater than, than what uh, individual commissioners are able to achieve on their own. Um, so I think it, it's, it's important to acknowledge that different systems are in, are in different stages. I think it's also true to say that in different circumstances, um, the same system might be doing something particularly well or, or facing particular challenges, but that's my analysis of the, of the current situation and clearly what worked like this, um, the discharge policy and, and a lot of activity that's going on is trying to achieve is to support systems to move away from the left and towards the right um, and in as much a, in as most uh, consistent a way as possible. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Just a brief reference to the policy um, um, uh, and the, 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 the land that it lays for us really that um, I think like all the best policies, it doesn't force something to happen. It confirms and reiterates what we all think should have been happening for a long time. Um, and I hope there's what we see in front of us now is is of that nature that um, yes, it expects CCGs and, and, and LAs to jointly commission care. I, I'd hope that most of us see that as a good thing. Um, the next bit, we may have different views on it, but the policy clearly sets out that uh, LAs would be the lead commissioner unless otherwise agreed. Um, and I think there's an opportunity in here as well that, that, and I'll talk about funding more in a minute, but what this funding um, and fund I think does do is two things firstly. Um, hopefully it stops funding being the main topic of conversation um, and hopefully what it also does is um, release some of that um, innovation and different ways of working that, that can sometimes become problematic um, when people are having to, uh, to account for, um, for, for all the money that's being spent. If we can move on to the next one. I won't go through this in detail, but I, I just tried to think long and hard in, in preparing for this session about what are the challenges? What 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 is the reason why we're not all jointly commissioning in a fantastic way across the board, and that that's what's happening as the norm? And and th these are just my reflections, really, um, in, in no particular order as well. Um, that clearly, something about uh, individual relationships, and and I think a lot of this rests on how. how effective or not they are and that, that might be at different levels. Something as well around the structures and by that I mean the infrastructure of organisations and how they're set up. Um, I don't think that prevents or demands um, effective joint working but I certainly think it, think it can make things easier or more difficult. Um, unfortunately I think history plays a part in this and we've all heard that well it didn't work last time so why would it work this time? Ignoring the fact that the world's changed and turned on its head since we tried it last time. Um, but I do recognise the reality of that. Uh, and, and that's usually something that, um, that that people cling on to when things perhaps aren't working so well. Um, but I think the reverse is more true that where things have worked well, that should give us a springboard um, for further joint working in the future. Um, just recognising that different organisations operate differently as well, ways of working um, that, you know, they will be different and we need to overcome that as well. Um, funding, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but I think probably the key thing here is to just recognise that this is such a difficult thing to do, that the, the, work, the jobs we do, the, the systems we operate in, the pressure that we're under, the changes that are, are being made, this is really, really difficult and complex stuff. Um, and it's not a science where we can say if we do a bit of A and a bit of B, then C will come out of it. This is, this is unpredictable as well. So I think that's about recognising that, um, but doing so in a way that helps us find a way through it uh, and not being hampered by either that or any of the challenges that, that I've tried to set out.
I also just want to talk a little bit about opportunities as well. Uh, and I think there are lots of opportunities around um, joint permissioning. Um, the first aspect of that seems to be to me to be some some on one level, some understanding of the different priorities across the system. Um, and, and that's not just from the commissioning organisations, but but system wide uh, with the queues, with providers, just understanding what those priorities are. I think where the commissioners can agree on what those priorities are and can then work towards common objectives and actions. Um, and I've seen that probably most effectively where where commissioners look at the little things. So don't try and build this huge system, but actually look at the things where there is an absolute common interest uh, and a shared goal typically around things like market management, where there's there's just a collective view that where where two commissioners work together and then work with the market in a coherent way that everyone benefits. Um, but at the heart of that is just that shared basic understanding of what everyone's trying to achieve. And I would say within that some recognition of some of the challenges that each party faces as well. Um, reablement, reablement has been around a long time. The, the phrase reablement, um, I, when I uh, when I think back to what reablement started out as um, uh, where I think we are now, I see two very different things, almost two unrecognisable things. Um, and, and I think there's a there's a significant rethink that is happening, but is also needed on on what reablement used to be. It used to be a very discreet, bespoke six week service that people kind of got hung up on. You know, it's got to be six weeks or it can't be more than six weeks. And, and that became the focus of attention or it was used um, especially where it was an in-house provision, it was used as a provider of last resort. And actually, if we're honest, lots of people receiving that service didn't need or want or would benefit from reablement at all. It, it was just an easy way of uh, of providing home care um, to, to solve up perhaps other issues. Um, I'd hope that more that we're now thinking of it more as as, a, as probably one of the only tools that we've got to support people either to become independent to prevent uh, admission or to support discharge from hospital, but seeing it at, at all ends of the spectrum, not just very much focused at, at supporting discharge. Um, and I think the more that that reablement function is used and the more value it adds, um, hopefully the benefits will be to all, especially the person receiving it, but to joint commissioners and providers across the board. Um, the, the last point, probably one that's worth just reflecting on as well, that where I see that things aren't working well, where relationships have broken down, what you tend to see is a fixation on what's not working well and actually a pretty inaccurate analysis. So people tend to focus on we need more dom care provision because that's the bottleneck when actually provisions has been going up month after month after month. What we're actually seeing is issues further um, up, upstream, if you like, that are creating a bottleneck. So people looking at where the problem appears to be, but actually not considering the wider system and not actually trying to solve the underlying issues. That tends to be a, a common characteristic of uh, of where things are, have broken down and not working so well. I think where things are working particularly well, what you tend to see is an acknowledgement that um, what we're trying to achieve, how do we best do that? And then a trust in each other to get there. Um, not just focusing on activity or what the numbers say, but a real trust in if we all do the right things, we'll deliver the right outcome. So uh, I would just summarise and, and conclude by saying uh, I would say, unfortunately, there are some systems and some areas that are still um, kind of way behind where they would want to be, um, but lots of improvement and a real commitment around this. And I think the policy just adds to that. Um, but hopefully a lot of learning from this session around how people can very tangibly um, improve the, the systems that they're part of. So uh, I'll conclude there. Leon, thanks ever so much. That was um, that was really lovely and, and valuable. Thank you. Um, so with what we'll do is we'll wait until the very end of everybody speaking until we go to questions. So I'll move on now, please, to Dr Andrew Williams and Dennis Holmes from ESIST. Thank you. And sorry, Leon, if I say something slightly different and do talk about some numbers, um, I apologise. Uh, I've maybe come at this from a different different point of view. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So uh, one of the things that that I found some places struggled with and certainly was was an issue where I worked down in Dorset was we had the 
principles of discharge to assess there's this and if you go on to the next slide um the, the this house i think is a brilliant diagram but it felt that lots of people got stuck with this and again if you go on to the next slide this pathway about numbers and and they were really high level numbers and then it almost felt like it gave a, a description of where we'd like to be but didn't quite tell us how to get there and it felt that that then led to us not quite knowing what the next steps were to be um can you go on to the next slide so uh i accept we're working in a really complex system this was something i'd done in a hospital i used to work in um trying to work out our flow through the hospital and trying to describe a system and what the flow looks like in nearly right numbers to get an idea about what it looks like and that really helped with some of our planning for how we manage the flow of patients through a hospital getting on to the next slide please so what i did was spend a little bit of time trying to look at some of the the papers that John Bolton had written and the numbers he'd he'd used that had been behind the national guidance to try and get an idea about what this should look like and what what we should be doing. Going on to the next slide, please. Um, and just to be aware on reading through his things, John very clearly, and I'm not trying to talk for John, um, please don't think that, but he comes from a social care background. So a lot of his work was around those services that, that local authorities uh, fund through social care and didn't really talk about some of those things that traditionally sit under health, such as end of life care and CHC. And again, his work was looking at what, what would a good system look like and what are the optimal care pathways? And for that, there needs to be a rapid discharge from secondary care with short lengths of stay and not where we put patients in assessment beds or beds where they're waiting for something, because we know when we keep people, older people in beds, they decondition and they become more disabled and need more care on discharge. Next slide, please. So that, that's the kind of background he came from to be interpreting this. So I, I I tried to come up with some numbers and what we did in our patch was say we can look at this across our whole, we're an integrated care system, we look at this across our whole patch, we can break down those numbers and if we know the numbers in different areas, look at it by what does the community provider response need to look like. We've got one community provider, two local authorities and three acute hospitals. So we could chunk it down and say what does this look like in different areas and if we're thinking about the teams that provide those those services on discharge. Again, what does that look like in different localities? And, and as an example, in Dorset, we've got, got um, a mix of some uh, urban areas and some rural areas where how we might provide those services might look quite different. And the last thing I think is just really having some data to say, what can we benchmark ourselves against and what should we be aspiring to provide rather than what have we traditionally always done? Can you go on to the next slide, please? So. This is what it ended up looking like, and I'll go through these bits of each of the pathways in turn and just explain what, what's, what I've taken out of John Bolton's papers to, to get there. Can you go on to the next slide? So I, just very briefly on pathway zero, and I think we really need to focus on pathways one and two more, but pathway zero, I think everybody felt, uh, well, how do we achieve this 50% um, and patients aged over 65 that are returning, leaving hospital with no care? And I think there's a pushback to secondary care colleagues a little bit about saying some of these are people that will just literally get up and pick up their stuff and walk out of hospital but there's also a need for what I've kind of described as almost an augmented pathway zero for those people that can leave but don't at the moment because they're still kept in beds for longer and is that using um, IV antibiotics more in the community is that having a kind of virtual ward for discharge type approach or is that hospital at home but it, it's secondary care thinking differently and moving away from being very bed based and, and I think there's some pushback about actually some of this responsibility sits with secondary care providers think about doing things differently. Next slide, please. Looking at pathway one. So if you read John Bolton's work, so this is the 45%, the 45 per 100. He very clearly says in his, and it, it got labelled as 45% of all, all our discharges need a package care on discharge and it made everyone go, oh my God, what are we going to do? That, that um, about 20, about half those patients, about 20 per 100, don't actually need a package of care on discharge. They may have an existing package of care, they may not have a package of care, but what they need is some therapy input for self-management and regaining their independence. They're not needing formal care. And I think that's, so that then takes down your 45 per 100 down to uh, 25 per 100 and makes it a much manageable number. He then very clearly talks about needing different approaches and some people only needing up to a couple of weeks and that being up to kind of 10 per 100 of these patients of needing quite short term. Um, and I'm very aware that I'm a uh, coming from a health background, talking to lots of social care people. But what I as a mal misinformed doctor would describe as traditional 
reablement approach. So the expectation that in a week or two, these people are going to either get back to their pre-existing package of care, having needed a short-term step up, or need a short-term package of care where they regain their independence in a really short period of time, not needing the whole six weeks. And I think that's one of the things we need to set expectations really clearly for people at the beginning. He then says there's another kind of 15 of that 45, so 15 per 100, who do need that complex long-term bit and may well need a package of care at the end of it, but that the best outcomes in terms of reducing the need for long-term packages of care are with a very um, intermediate care approach, joining up health and social care um, and having kind of long, uh, the whole six week period potentially, um, and potentially in quite a large amount of care at the beginning. What John does give in his papers as some advice is saying, if you take an average patient on the, what I would describe as the, the quicker, easier and the longer, more complex pathways, and I accept that they're not the best terms, um, that that's looking at an average for each patient about 20 hours care per week. So averaging it out over a six week period is 120 hours. So for every 100 people leaving hospital, that's about 500 care hours of face to face care per week. And, and from local data we had, that looked about being about 30 whole time equivalent staff. Now that will vary based on efficiency and geography, but it allowed us to make some ideas about what teams needed to look like and how big this was. The other bit I put in here is another pathway that's not really talked about in John's work, but is clearly part of the discharge to assess, is those people who have got, are reaching end of life and need a kind of end of life care for one or two weeks at home, is, is needing a, a package of care alongside their palliative care at home. And that wasn't really in John's work because he, that was not traditionally social, social care funded care. So next slide, please. So again, just a little bit. So that, that first part of the pathway one, this isn't new packages of care that those 20 per 100. These are people that may have a package of care, may not need a package of care, may need signposting to the voluntary sector, may need a home visit. It's that kind of assessment advice, reassurance, guidance and signposting type care. Um, and is that best done using a kind of place based care approach? Um, but I think it's some it's commissioned very differently to very different parts of the country. Next slide, please. Can we go on to the next slide? Oh, oh sorry, no, sorry, I, you, it went forward, I missed it. So can you go back one, sorry? So then that, that short-term care with a relevant model of, so for every 100 patients, if you've got them for two weeks, that is loaded about 20 patients. Um, but I think this care needs to be something that is using that type of reopening approach of these are care hours that are ready to go, not something that needs to be broken for each individual patient. On to the next slide, please. And then this is the more complex pathway of needing six weeks of care. Um, and if you add up for every patient that go up needing this type of care for up to six weeks, then you can end up with quite large caseloads. And I think that then ask a question about how do you manage those teams and those caseloads in, in real life and reality. On to the next slide. Pathway two is the best bed-based things. And again, if you look at most systems, I think we've got way too many beds um, and we've become very reliant upon beds. So this is saying in an ideal world, if you don't spend a long time in acute care, deacon, that's, that's only four patients per 100 discharges. If they stay a whole six weeks, then that's only actually needing 24 beds to for every 100 discharges so they work through the system. And compared to how things used to be traditionally, um, Sorry, I've lost my sound here. I can't hear myself. Um, those people used to stay until they finished their care, but now we're looking at those people should only be staying in a community hospital until they no longer need that care there and can be kind of discharged onto pathway one. In lots of parts of the country, there is also a bit of uh, community hospital usage that is around uh, managing people with um, non-specialist end of life care in community hospitals, particularly in more or rural areas where there isn't necessarily good hospice provision. Can we go on to the next slide? Pathway three is really small numbers, and I think it, we need to move away from this being a normal thing to happen. This is, shouldn't be a routine occurrence, um, and it's quite at odds with the reality in lots of parts of the country. Can we go on to the next slide? So this was trying to put it all together. Um, it's, we're sharing the slides, so it may be easier to spend a little bit of time looking at it, but trying to look at those flows through and what that looks like for an average pathway. Can we go on to the next slide? So 
in these next few slides, I'm not going to talk through them now for, for time, but they're in the pack. And this was using a real system and trying to put those numbers in. So this was somewhere that had 500 discharges per week, and you can scale it up and say, this is what needs to be provided. Can we just go through these next few slides? Can we go forward over the next four? So this was just looking at what do these numbers look like and what does it allow us to look like to, to plan the care? Can we go forward, next one, and the next one, and the next one? You may just want to look at these in uh, afterwards, but I haven't really got time to do them now. What I would say is when we is at this point is looking at it. We know lots of systems are very, very reliant upon beds. And if you look at the spending that's been claimed so far against scheme two, so that's the 588 million from September, 61% of that claim so far has been against care home beds. And I'm not really sure that's home first and, and we're delivering what home first is. And it's just trying to Part of this work was trying to get our system thinking about how do we develop home first and stop being reliant upon so reliant upon beds. Dennis is is here now and he's used some of these slides in a system to try and talk to the commissioners about how they might do things differently. If I hand over to Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think that um, I've um, with the systems that I've worked with come at this from a slightly different angle. But using Andrew's um, workings to help commissioners to think about what the workforce requirements would be to be able to respond to, to these kinds of these kinds of numbers in a system. And, and in particular, just working through the pathways. And I don't intend to spend a lot of time over what I'm about to say. There's something about having the right staff in the right place with the right skills. And that requires commissioners to do some really quite detailed work to look at whether they think that they've got staff in the right place to provide the kind of quantums of care to people in their own homes, which is the the underpinning um, uh, logic of the of the uh, discharge requirements. Um, there's a consideration of uh, the balance of where therapy is located between acute and community services, and that's in recognition of the fact that reablement and the kind of support planning at the intermediate tier for people who are going home first seems to work best when it's therapy led um, and that the support plans for people in their own homes are overseen by therapists. So I think. There's a challenge for commissioners to think about the the, the balance of a, a therapeutic intervention and that then kind of moves into contemplation of the kind of domiciliary care support that's needed in localities. One of the other things that I've helped systems to think about are the different kinds of responses that might need to be made in urban areas, rural areas and super rural areas where it's up often very difficult to deploy the kind of staff to support people in their own homes when you've got people who live very remotely and it's difficult to get specialist staff out to see them. The next consideration is, is thinking about where staff are being used to support bed bases and potentially those staff and the, the skill sets that those staff have could be best providing care to people in their own homes and helping commissioners to think about how they make the shift from releasing staff from supporting bed bases to be able to support staff in their own homes. And I think that one of the other things that I've tried to do with systems in the work that I've done with them is to think creatively about how um, uh, opportunities around use, the use of personal assistance, personal health budgets and, and personal care budgets might provide some opportunities to be able to support larger quantums of people in their own home post discharge as part of the discharge requirements. So principally it's just what I've got to say is just a, an invitation and an invocation to to commissioners of health and social care services to think collectively about how they plan the workforce requirements, the deployment of the workforce requirements and the skill mix in their particular communities. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That's been really, really helpful. So I'm going to come over to Jenny Stevens and Tim Golby now, please, from the Devon system. 
Hi everybody, um, just to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our learning with you. We enter this in the spirit of we haven't got it all cracked and um, there's plenty more to do in Devon. Um, we'll be open about the things that we've learned along the way, the things that have worked well and the things that haven't gone so well. Um, and we don't feel precious about that at all. So please feel free to ask us about that as, uh, when we get to the panel. The other thing that I wanted to say was that we're trying really hard in these really difficult times to balance um, keeping a focus on the, what we've got to do, the urgent today things, but also balancing that with the important things. Um, and I hope that comes through, but it is a challenge and it's something that we're uh, working on every day and uh, reminding ourselves about every day. Next slide, please. So I'll go through this slide and then I'll hand over to Tim for the next three. But basically, I just wanted to highlight um, a little bit about the context that we're working in. Devon is a huge county. It's one of the biggest ge geographies, um, large population. You can see there the range of NHS provision uh, that we work with and also um, the district and city councils. We've got eight. We've also got a large number of independent sector care providers as well, 320 resident nursing across Devon County. Uh, so a lot of small and medium enterprise businesses um, and then about another 200 uh, social care providers in uh, personal care and supported living. I think um, the key for us is um, it's quite hard in a large county in terms of deprivation. It's um, spread across a large uh, rural area. You've got pockets of significant deprivation in those deep rural patches, also along our coastal um, parts of Devon, um, but also in the city of Exeter. So we try hard to um, make sure that we're looking at that whole range and focusing on uh, the what the joint strategic needs assessment is telling us. So the evidence base that Tim will come on to talk about is really important and that relationship with our public health colleagues and uh, the wonderful rich data that they have at town level is really key to us and board level. Um, I, I think it's been said before, so I won't, won't go on about it, but this bit about the importance of trust and relationships is key. I have for the last large number of years that I've been a director, um, spent every month I meet with each of my um, acute trust, um, community health and mental health providers, chief execs, on a monthly basis and we all prioritise that. So I meet with them individually, uh, what I'd call the coffee um, conversations where you can have those informal conversations, but also um, weekly, formally uh, as part of our ICS developments. Um, I also meet with the accountable officer for the CCG. I think those informal and formal settings are really important and um, I know we all know that, uh, but in these times when we're all working so hard, it's really important to hold on to uh, those relationships and have those difficult conversations and also have some um, just ordinary conversations together. Um, so for me, that's a really key part of this alongside the data. That's enabled us um, to uh, create since 2008, we created joint uh, provider team, so the operational care management teams uh, for adult social care um, are all co-located and jointly managed up to uh, and including assistant director level and we've had that relationship since 2008. So the jointness goes deep into all our teams where you've got community nursing, therapy, and um, social care staff, social care assessors, social workers and OTs, all working uh, in joint teams co-located. Um, on the joint commissioning side, we have a number of joint appointments. Tim's one of them, so I won't uh, say any more about that, but they are key. I think to have 
uh, joint operational arrangements, we need joint commissioning. Otherwise, our teams get mixed priorities, mixed strategies, um, uh, two different lots of policy direction. And that's the bit that the joint commissioners can really bring together um, and uh, work collaboratively across uh, commissioning and provision. Um, so going forward and recognising the importance of that collaboration, we're really up for influencing the direction of the ICS. We're currently in shadow form. Um, it really is important, isn't it, for us to really get that focus on community, on well-being and working uh, more upstream um, and not solely focused on um, the hospital and what happens there because that's a key part of um, helping us with hospital discharge. Let's avoid fewer uh, people going into hospital. We've also got our local care partnerships, um, which sit underneath the ICS. And for Devon County Council, there are four of those given our geography. Tim leads on one of those for us on the biggest area. So again, you'll hear more about that from him. But that's the place where we coordinate the work with our primary care colleagues who are absolutely key to helping us avoid um, unnecessary admissions where possible um, and really get that focus on community and wellbeing. Uh, and then we're working really hard on let's have the right conversations and let's do the right thing uh, for people using the do, um, uh, discharge to assess policy. We aren't there with that. We've got more to do, but we're really trying hard to keep that focus on doing the right thing. And some of the things that the previous speaker was talking about. I'll now hand over the next slide and to Tim. Thank you, Jenny. I thought I'd just run through um, some of the learning that we've had through the discharge to assess implementation. Um, so just to be clear, I'm responsible for two subsystems working around acute hospital footprints. Uh, and this is some of the learning that we've had from some of those and across the whole county of Devon. So I think and I put a sort of little self assessment, if you like, at the end of each statement. So I think um, what COVID did was compelled us to come together. And we did. And I think there's been some really rich learning from that and holding on to that as um, we try to juggle all the competing priorities now is key. But um, we've developed across each of our four footprints across the Devon ICS locality huddles where the whole system comes together. And I think that's been rich in learning. It involves clinicians and managers and the real richness has been the ability, I think, in that first point there to begin to share professional risks across organisations. And that has moved on leaps and bounds from the beginning of COVID. Um, again, I think we're rich in able to identify people who are eligible for discharge to assess. And we have, I think, built trust between teams simply because we meet daily through the acute system escalation calls, but we have a more strategic weekly call where we look at the sorts of issues that are uh, impacted by discharge to assess. So trust between teams is absolutely growing. Do I think or do I hear of examples where that still bubbles up in an unhelpful way? Of course I do, but I do think we have an openness to resolve those things now that we didn't have previously. Now I've assessed us on cultural change with a cross. I mean that may be a bit harsh, but we still have some way to go with our particularly with our acute service colleagues um, and I think we're having constant battles to shift the bit the business out of hospital settings and that is a major challenge for us if I was to characterize it I think I think senior management have got that but as you get down into ward based staff I think we've got some way to go and um, that's why I've marked it as not going as well as we might want it to be I think the next point about awareness of services developed at home is a real bonus here. So there tends to be a focus, in my view, of personal care. Home care is all that matters, but there's a richness of services out there in the community voluntary sector, other sorts of services, supported living that are all available that we haven't focused upon. Uh, and that is now open and we're trying to hook our uh, systems into those access to those services rather than being hooked on just personal care. Uh, it is worth saying we've uh, we don't operate a pooled funding arrangement in Devon. Um, we see that as uh, something that will follow once we've got our commissioning strategy right, rather than driving it. I will talk a bit more in a moment about our work around mapping the capacity of the out hospital sectors, um, and that has been a real strength and has really prioritised where we need to focus our attention. Uh, prior to COVID, I think continuing healthcare it was a uh, 
a real challenge for us. That has now improved massively and the relationships between the NHS CHC teams and the Health Authority are massively improved and working really well. And when we come to some of the issues around home adaptations and equipment, we have a, a care provider who provides our equipment that is working well. But as Jenny said, we are a complex county with eight district councils to work through. And so our, I think it's a variable position. We have some really good examples and some examples where it's been less successful. So next slide, please. I just want to talk a bit about our hospital capacity plans, and there are four of these to reflect the four acute hospitals in Devon. Um, and the issues vary from place to place, as you would expect. And as has already been mentioned, significant variation in the assumptions around national pathway numbers and percentages and the actuals that came through the COVID process. And we need to understand that. But what it identified, I think, in all of them, that were some key issues that we need to tackle. This first one is the cultural, which is the managing the long term demand, the home first always message. Easier to say than do, particularly when you're in a, an acute hospital. So a lot of work around practice, um, both within those community teams, but particularly within the hospital setting, particularly around trying to shift some of the capacity in the hospital out of the hospital to support alongside the community. Progressing, but not always as easy to achieve as it is to say. Um, we absolutely have a capacity issue in some areas, particularly around personal care in parts of Devon and specialist dementia residential care. Really pleased to say that um, there is absolutely a joint commissioning approach to that and that um, I wouldn't say that's whilst the local authority leads. I think there's active support both from our NHS providers, but also our NHS commissioners to find solutions to some of those things. So um, that has been a real benefit. Our, our colleagues do understand the dilemmas that we've got there. And I think finally, um, seven day working in full. If, if you if you dare mention this in an acute trust, you'll get your head bitten off. Um, but what I mean is it is without fact, it is a fact, isn't it? That issues in hospital do slow down at weekend, but they do in the community. So I do think we've got to absolutely make sure that we do operate seven days. Now, I think that's a real challenge because um, you know we don't have a lot of workforce to do that, but we do need to do more around seven day working. And that leads me to the final point that wherever you go on this conversation, it does come back to a, a workforce question. And the workforce, as has been said by previous speakers, may not be in the right place and we do need to shift it around the system. And I think there's a recognition of that, but we also have a workforce gap. And I think that is the market development that is about making care a uh, health and care a profession to work in. I've seen in the chat bar about issues around terms and conditions uh, of, of social care workers. We've got a major piece of national work to address that um, because if we don't, we are ending up with a two tier workforce, health workforce and a social care workforce, and there'll always be this particular gap. So for me, all issues lead to the quality of the workforce. Next slide, please. So I, I just want a bit of a reflection. I'm not a great fan of um, being told what to do. Working in local government, one can always um, resist, I think, a little bit the, uh, the the requirements of the regulator. But I do think the D2A stock take was a really helpful tool because it compelled and opened up conversations that otherwise may not have happened. I think it's forced those partnership models at local care partnership level and it has brought a really focused attention on practice, particularly in the acute setting, and has allowed us to begin to unpick some of those things. So good work going on, but the reality today in Devon is there are still too many assessments conducted in hospital. Um, it's understood and we're talking about it, but shifting the workforce from one place to another and implementing those pathways in full is going to take a bit of time. And I think we needed the regulatory attention to address the wicked issues, and I think it's been uh, helpful to do that. So uh, much has been improved, um, but there is still plenty more to do. So I wouldn't want to say Devon's got all the answers, but I think the uh, the approach we've taken has absolutely made a step change in performance. And most importantly, discharge to assess is about doing the right thing for our population and patients. And sometimes getting people home to their place where they're used to living is absolutely the right thing to do. Back to you, Jenny. Sorry, I was about to speak on mute then, and I've just seen the sun's um, come out, so apologies for having me kind of um, being in the dark there for a moment. Uh, very briefly, I think here uh, we're just saying there's lots more to do. Culture and practice, you never ever stop doing, do you? And if you think you've got there, you haven't. So you just have to keep 
uh, plodding away at that and really working hard in a respectful, thoughtful relationship. The only other thing I'd say is workforce is a huge challenge for us all. And I think the more we can do together um, through our various um, bodies, such as LGA, ADAS and others, the better. Many thanks. Jenny and Tim, thanks ever so much. That was fantastic and really valuable to be able to see and hear from uh, a system where it's working well, even though, as you said, there's still some to do, but working really well. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Helen, who's been managing the chat room with Kate um, and ask some questions, please, of the speakers so far and the panellists. And I, um, I'm sorry, I missed Matt West out from the Better Care Fund as well from the panellists as well. So thank you. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Angela. There's been some really great questions posted in the chat room and I shall start with directing um, some of the, the first couple at Leon, if that's OK. So Christy has asked, um, is there clarity on the £588 million and, uh, spend and how this works? Do we have any examples of a successful system? If so, could those be shared? Um, yeah, we can certainly share examples um, it's, in terms of it, beyond the policy, I don't know if Sarah Mitchell is on the call and wants to add anything, but beyond um, the policy, it's probably worth contacting Christy directly and trying to understand the specifics. Um, so maybe if we take that offline, um, otherwise I might waste a lot of time giving an answer that's not actually helpful. So, um, but yeah, we can certainly share good practice. I can come in if you want, um, just to say that the money is there to really prevent inappropriate or unnecessary admissions and to facilitate quicker discharges on top of what you would normally spend. And the things that really make a difference, and you you really want to be creative and flexible with this money, because we want to show the government and the treasury that we can make this work in the way that places have described this morning, is to really think about what would make a difference to this person not going into hospital. If it's 24 hour care, if it's someone coming to live in, if it's additional community health or social work support or primary care support, mobilize it quickly. It's all about the, the rapid response uh, that you can do to avoid an admission. And on discharge, as um, I think it was Andrew said um, and Leon earlier, uh, we've got so many people still going into residential care homes and we know all the issues that relate to that in COVID. This money can facilitate people going home uh, on a package, an enhanced package for a short time uh, to help them and to help families and to be honest to help some clinicians understand that if we're managing the risk proactively putting in intensive um, support for a short time then people definitely want to go home and can go home with that kind of support so we really want to use this money to prove that actually people can end up where they want to go and you can be as creative as you like and if you want a good system that are doing it well talk to Surrey they're doing some really interesting stuff they were on a webinar earlier for us about getting people home and nobody uh, waits for a residential care bed they go through reablement or short-term step-down bed Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering those questions so succinctly. So um, Catherine has also asked, and this is um, really for um, Leon, Leon again. Um, in the um, in the challenges and opportunities section, is there any suggestions on how to tackle um, issues with parity of esteem and T's and C's across health and social care, especially when joint commissioning? Yeah, so there's obviously a wider issue there around the national picture and um, uh, and you know, the, the desire that we should have parity of esteem and, and T's and C's to follow. But thinking just specifically and locally, I think the reablement's a really good example that the more um, I work with com commissioners, but particularly providers on this, the more it becomes obvious that reablement isn't a different type of home care. Reablement is something entirely different, um, albeit th the same providers might be involved, but it's this, it's a different thing, a different service. Um, and the skills that it asks for and requires um, are not only skills that I think are um, should be funded in a different way, in a better way and supported differently, um, but actually things that are worth paying more for. So I think there's there's an element there of of a progression. So I think where we see reablement is just a different bit of home care, but actually the same T's and C's. 
I, I think we're trying to put a round peg in a square hole there. I think reablement's a really good example of where if you think differently about what you're trying to achieve and then think differently about how you get there, how you pay for it, um, being paying providers, how providers in turn their stru then structure and pay for um, the work that their colleagues and staff do and what training looks like in that respect. I think that offers a really good progression um, and something that not only delivers what the commissioners want, but actually is is creating a, a, a wider um, social care and more diverse social care workforce as well, which I think ticks a lot of the boxes around um, workforce support, T's and C's, parity of esteem, etc. So I think there's a big issue nationally, but I think in, locally there's there's things that can be done um, in relation to what we're discussing here. Lovely, thank you. Really, really helpful. Um, I'm just moving on because I'm very conscious that we are um, nearly running out of time and I just wanted to get this question in for Andrew and Dennis. And John has asked, um, his pathway zero drastically differs um, from the John Bolton model. So for example, there's 87% on pathway zero and, and he believes that maybe they're counting these on emission avoidance, ED attends and discharges from CDU. And it would really just like a breakdown of how this model was developed and is it available? Um, so uh, the last slide on the presentation had three references to three of the papers from John Bolton where he talks about how he developed his numbers. He very clearly came from a premise of looking at care for over 65s leaving hospital and I, I think those numbers have been taken and used for the guidance without anybody saying exactly what do they mean. So I think when it comes to planning it's saying if you look what are numbers of over 65 year old discharges in this system, this trust, how we want to look at it. I think it's really quite rare uh, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected for your under 65s to be needing lots of new care or new care home placements or community hospital uh, rehabilitation on leaving acute care. It, it doesn't happen very often. So I think those numbers of under 65s almost all go into pathway zero, um, but I'm not sure they're a big enough number when it starts looking at how you plan your services to worry about the under 65s adding those numbers in. Similarly, he was focusing on the um, unscheduled care. So there are some people who are going for elective care and need care on discharge. But again, that should be planned as part of their workup for their, their elective operation. And, and I'm not sure is a big co-founder when it comes to planning services. I think those numbers are quite small. That's great, thank you. Thank you very much. And just time for one more question, and this is for Jenny and Tim. Um, what funding um, and contracting mechanism are you using to jointly commission your intermediate services? So section 75 or section 256? Uh, so shall I have a go at that? So I think we're, um, w I, the answer is I don't honestly know at this moment, but what we have is a good joint uh, arrangement with our commissioning teams where we are having a we're leading so I think it'll almost certainly be on a 256 arrangement where we will uh, hold the contract but we've got a risk share arrangement with our clinical commissioning group who hold the NHS funds for this so that's the approach we're taking we're leading um, but we have an open and honest risk share arrangement with that uh, as an example we've um, block purchased a number of uh, beds and we've uh, had the voids issue underwritten by the CCG in the last few days so um, I think that's a good example of the quality relationships that we have um, but I think that this is new business for us and probably where we need to move into uh, pooled funds that we haven't done to date. And hello, just coming in, Matthew West from uh, the BCF team. So we had a bit of a discussion about this when we were first looking at the um, the new discharge policy. Um, in the guidance, we talked about Section 75s in the sense that they are, as well as a, a sort of being able to uh, create sort of a funding transfer, it's about commissioning. So it allows, say, a local authority to commission health services and vice versa. So I think if you're doing those more sort of sort of deep rooted sort of joint commissioning arrangements, section 75 is probably better if it's more about so the example just now where say the CCG were helping underwrite what the local authority were doing around commissioning voids, then a section 256 um, is fine. Um, just to say that we worked with uh, some legal advisors back in April and developed uh, a model section 75 
a variation template to support the the first uh, tranche of the discharge to assess policy and I think it would work well for the second one too so it's on the better care exchange at the moment. Lovely thank you very much and obviously we've run out of time now I'm very conscious there's more questions so actually we can um, as a panel and a group have a look through those questions and answer individually and we really appreciate your participation in the questioning that have been great today so we're just going to pass back to Angela now thank you Thanks very much, Helen. Thank you. So just to um, conclude our session today, then we have a number of future webinars. So we have one um, Thursday this week, Tuesday and Thursday next week. Uh, the links will, are included in the slide pack um, which will be sent out after this. So please do access them um, tickets through Eventbrite. Next slide, please. And we will be posting the recordings from these webinars on our YouTube channel as well. Next slide, thank you. And on the 25th of November between 12 and 1.30, Matthew Wynne, who is the Director of Community Health, uh, will be running a webinar then for COVID and urgent community response. So please do join that as well. And again, tickets are available through Eventbrite. Um, as well, just to point out, um, the ESIS network is a site that's been developed to support you in through your improvement journey. It's a, a network to share ideas both nationally and internationally, so uh, please do um, encourage you to join that. The link is uh, again available in the slide deck. It's at the bottom left hand side of the screen now. Click on that link and that will take you through to be able to join. So do access that for all of the uh, latest policies, guidance, documents and again networking opportunities. And just to bring to your attention as well, the Better Care Fund, the Emergency Care Improvement Support Team and the Local Government Association are working in collaboration with each other to implement the dis uh, hospital discharge service policy and operating model. Um, it is a joint improvement offer from the national team and delivered through the local systems. So there's a fantastic slide there to be able to familiarise yourself with the policy, with the high impact models for changes for, trans uh, for transfers of care and any relevant information will help you to be able to implement the policy and through the joint support offer. Uh, we've now included in the pack um, a feedback slide so uh, if we could ask you to give some feedback on this webinar today and we will be including that on future webinars uh, again included in the slide pack we will be very very grateful. And finally, a huge thank you. Thank you to our speakers today. It's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you to all of you for taking up the time to be able to join us to uh, listen today. Um, for information and regular updates, please do sign up for the bulletin and the Better Care Exchange. The link uh, is within that page. And also, if you do have any discharge to assess related queries, please do email um, the email address at the top of the page there. And we will be absolutely delighted to get back to you to help with any queries that you do have. Thank you once again to all of our colleagues um, who have been involved today, to Helen and Kate uh, in the chat room, to our speakers and to our panellists and we look forward to um, welcoming you into our webinar again on Thursday. Thank you. <laughs>